Happy Friday and good afternoon from the Shreveport office of Eagle Financial. It's a beautiful day here outside, probably 80 degrees and all sun. It's also a beautiful day in the markets today with uh, the broad market up roughly 1% across the board, the NASDAQ market up a little bit less than that. So that's bringing the S&P 500 up about 5% year to date. We still have about five minutes to go here in the close. Uh, bond yields again escalating. So uh, this is something that's caused in the last few weeks, uh, most of the turmoil, this back and forth in the stock market. Um, we've, had, we've had the NASDAQ market really go through a full blown, more than 10% correction because as we said on the last episode, the lower yielding NASDAQ stocks are really a long duration asset. The term duration normally going with highly interest rate sensitive, long dated bonds like 30 year US treasuries. So uh, in the last few days though, we've had, we had the bond market settle down, uh, calm things down a little bit. So we've seen the NASDAQ market, you know, recover a little bit, but today, uh, NASDAQ stocks are lagging, uh, the Dow up about eight tenths of a percent as we, it's actually up, uh, strengthening coming into the close. It's up 1.1%, the S and P up about the same silver unchanged at $25 and five cents an ounce, uh, gold up $6 to 17.33. West Texas intermediate huge story of the year. Uh, up two dollars and twenty cents today. That's about three and a half percent to sixty dollars and seventy four cents. I noticed this the other day at the pump bill that gasoline prices are probably up fifty or sixty cents this year. So Russell two thousand, the small cap index, up about a percent as well. Uh, with uh, safe havens, treasuries, the two year note back down to uh, 16 basis points or 16 one hundredths of a percent. The 10 year escalating to 167. That's again from 0.93 at year end and the 30 year at 2.38, meaning that if you haven't refinanced your mortgage and you're thinking about it, you, you uh, really yeah. need to do that now. Do it yesterday. So, uh, today we have a special guest. <laughs> a dear friend of ours named Steve Umberger, and he's here all the way from Ponte Vedra, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, lives on a golf course there. He's a sports fan like the rest of us. He is a VMI uh, classmate of mine. Both of us were there, class of 1983. Uh, he's actually 20 days older than I am. We both have birthdays coming up and they're milestone birthdays, by the way, too. You look pretty good, by the way, Steve. <laughs> so for reminding me. <laughs> Steve is a fascinating character. Uh, we reconnected a few years ago, really through, why don't you, why don't you tell us the story and tell us, and then give us, tell us about our, your sports background at VMI and how we all came to know you and my brother, David. Yeah, um, I'm Steve Umberger, and Dave and I used to, Dave, Dave's Jack's brother, we used to work out all the time in the weight room, and we played ball together, football, and then they allowed us to run track just to kind of stay in shape, and you were you were all American, and I was just on the team. So it was it was fun to play football and track, and got a, got an education in the process. Okay, that's cool. Okay, now the, the part of the story that, that I remember is Steve actually had uh, aspirations to be a, an NFL football player. And he was, you were second team all Southern conference. Is right, that right? right? Yes. In fact, uh, we we're in the FCS division now. And I think that year was the last year we had a winning season there. Yeah. Although VMI is uh, man, this is kind of, kind of prophetic or interesting. Anyway, they're four and and nationally ranked right now, but they haven't had a winning season since we were there. And they went six, three and one defeated army on the Hudson river, 14 to seven, I think, right. and then traveled to Blacksburg for the last game of the year and denied the Virginia tech Hokies, a tangerine bowl berth winning seven to three. And Steve had two interceptions in the game. 
yeah. playing defensive back. That's going way back. <laughs> that's going way back. So that's how I remember. We like to throw some sports in here, but Steve found himself had a had a tryout with the Giants and had aspirations to play in the NFL, and that didn't work out. And I remember him telling a story that he found himself slicing meats and 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 wondered what what he was doing there. So uh, so what happened after that? You went back to school, right? Yeah, well, I went to IBM real quickly. Then I went back to William and Mary to get my master's. And okay. then, uh, and my, I was from the DC area, and I was looking at the CIA and the FBI. And my dad was in the Defense Department. He said, "Go make some money, go to IBM." So I just got into technology and and got really into that. So it was fun because we got in the internet business when no one knew how to spell the internet. So yeah. we um, we started providing. One of my investments was with Highway Technologies, and no one knew how to get email or statistics or websites or shopping carts. So we were the largest in the world at providing websites in the, in the mid '90s. And then I got another deal that we um, were the first cost per click advertising with a company called Value Click, and that went public. Okay, so let me let me back up. The, what was the first company? Called? Highway Technologies. Highway Technologies. Now you invested. Uh, kind of a small sum of money, and that is a venture capital deal. Right. Was that right? And right. how that went up like a hundred times or something? Yeah, and I, you know, the structure was important because I put in ten percent of the deal. I bought, mm -hmm. put in, put in a, a big chunk of my net worth at the time, and I said, if we get this many customers, I'll get, you know, ten more percent of the company, and we went flying by that. So oh, wow. you know, it, it was good because we were. We were working hard and it was an exciting time because the internet was just growing. We just didn't know if it was a fad or if yeah. it was here to stay. And so um, then, so that we provided websites in 130 countries to, you know, big companies and, and individuals. So we, we, we were just rolling. Okay. So then, so that's awesome. So you took that investment capital and rolled it into company yeah. number two, right? Right. Tell us about that. Well, I had set up offices in, France and Germany and England and Japan and Brazil and oh, wow. for highway technologies. Okay. And so when we basically sold that company, I was in a meeting and, and uh, the CEO, the CEO of ValueClick and the founder came in and said, "I heard about this guy that set up these offices. Oh, wow. can, can you help? Can would can you join our company?" And I said, "Well, I don't need another job. I'd like to buy part of the company." So I bought part of ValueClick. Jim Zarley and a couple of friends of mine we put in and. Uh, you know, a lot of money, uh, a couple million bucks at the time. And it was just a startup company. And then we ended up growing that. And we did like 16 acquisitions over 15 year period, went public, and it was sold a couple of years ago. So, and so they're part of who now? They're part of ADS, which, okay, uh, yeah. which, which is a um, company based in Ohio. So it was, it was went public and went through an acquisition at the end. So it was really exciting. I got to sit at front, you know, at the table for some really cool okay. experiences. Mm. Okay. Bill, if you think of jump in there and fire away a question, if you think of something while we're, while we're going here. So uh, just give me a hand signal or something. So, so that's, so you're not really, so the value click thing is, is a done deal for you now. Then yeah. what happened after that? Um, Basically, I started investing my own money and uh, yeah. looking for companies to buy. And then, you know, Dave and I just started, decided to start a business in the food industry. So, okay, I was coming to that. But now you've, you've started, uh, you've started a number of companies or helped start a number of companies that have gone public. Is that right? Right. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, either public or sold. Like we started a, a barricade business in a self storage garage and, um, you know, we just grew that into a nice company in Florida and from a self storage garage and we got the barricades on the road with the signage and the aero boards and all that. So um, that was that was a tough. I, I remember being on the highway at two in the morning going, I can't believe I'm digging ditches. I mean, it's just so, oh, wow. you know, when you start up a business, you got to just figure it out. So, you know, that one and value click and highway were basically the ones that matter. But OK. And now well, we're Dave and I are just trying to build this business. Yeah. So tell us, why don't you uh, change gears here? Tell us why you're in town and, and what's going on with that. Well, we started a, a food. 
Okay, good for Questions. you, Bill. Okay, so Steve, I mean, you are an investor. Correct. You've been investing primarily in private equity, buying businesses. Can you speak to our audience about the difference between private equity and public equity? Yeah, I, th I think of public equity as listed companies on an exchange that have liquidity, proven management, existing products, mm -hmm. and you can buy those in any exchange and you can sell those readily. And I think of private equity as individual investments that are not liquid. You can't sell it tomorrow. There is no market for it. So it's a, it's a, it's a smaller buy typically and a, a less liquid buy. And you have to kind of typically to be successful, you have to be an expert in that field mm -hmm. or else you're just going to, you want to add value. If you, if you bring in money to a private equity deal, you want to say, how can I help you with marketing expertise, mm -hmm. technical expertise? So typically on a private investment, you'll add money and you'll add some talent to help that business grow. Well, it's kind of like the show Shark Tank. Right. It's like that. That's right. And so the investors are bringing something to the table besides money. Right. And that, yeah. and by the way, that is the difference between a good private equity investor and a bad one. I don't know if I've ever heard this, but I'm telling you now, a, a, a good private equity investor will add value mm -hmm. and can add some expertise. It is very common for a bad equity investor, private equity to say, I will add value with my money and they were nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they're, they buy the stock and the owner of the company said, where's the value? So there's there, you have to, if you're as an owner, you need to know who's investing in your company. What are the things that you look for when making an investment? I look for, do I understand the business, R truly understand it, because if you don't, it's dangerous. Um, there's a saying, who wins the fight between the shark and the alligator, uh, the bear and the alligator? And the answer is, it depends on where it's fought. You want to know whether you're in mm -hmm. the water or you're on the land, and you, you, get, you can't guess that one. So um, I look mm -hmm. at proven management, mm -hmm. uh, a solid market, whether it be regional or national, um, good economics, good margin. And, uh, so, you know, those type of things, you know, it's not so different than in the public markets. No. I mean, really a long-term investor in, in the public market should be looking at those things as well. And then, and then I'd like to throw something in there, you know, is the valuation is critical, Absolutely. you know, because you're not going to find a great, great company a low valuation. You're going to have to pay up for that, or you might be able to find a good company at a low valuation, but valuation is very important, especially like a market like today. Don't you think, Steve? Oh yeah. Yeah. You have yeah. to buy right. If you're going to hold, hold tight, you got to buy right. Cause if you buy wrong, it's going to be hard to hold. Mm, okay. That, that sounds like something we tell our own clients, yeah. the price yeah. you pay today for that investment, will be the single most important determinant of your future returns. Right. It's like buying a house way over market and then hoping that the market catches up to mm -hmm. it. You, timing, timing is not your friend because you're always behind the game. That's true. What, what else, William? Well, I mean, you mentioned uh, taking companies public, mm -hmm. the IPO process. Would, would you like to just, uh, speak to that, what's involved in, in taking a, a company public? Yeah, I, I, it's a very difficult thing to take, take a company public. Um, it takes a lot of effort. It's expensive. You have to, um, there's a lot of regulation on your S1. You have to write a detailed prospectus. You have to get <laughs> approval. You're dealing with underwriters. So lawyers, lawyers, underwriters, the whole nine yards. So it's not typically a, a hundred thousand dollar effort. It's multi-million dollar effort because it's an expensive exercise accountants to make sure everything is. And, and I have to say that we, as a, as a U.S. market do a good job of providing good financials to mm -hmm. the public market. Mm -hmm. it, 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 they insist on it. And, and the underwriters are there, the good underwriters, top notch underwriters at the top tier are going to expect you to have real quality earnings, typically solid revenue, solid management, and they're going to expect your reporting to be really buttoned down. So 
I have very good faith in, in, in the IPO market we have here in the mm -hmm. United States. So you need huge uh, quality accounting and legal, and yeah. then you need a great underwriters or a great lead underwriter with an underwriter, underwriters below them to, uh, mm -hmm. to find a market for the shares. Right. right. If you look at buying an IPO, you're going to want to sit there and go, what industry are they in? And is it, is it a solid industry right now with strength? Um, you're going to look at your underwriting, who's on the book, you know, is it Goldman, GP, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank on, on the left side of the book? Are they leading it? Mm -hmm. Because they have a strong network of, of brokers who are out there helping you. So you're looking at the company, its profitability, the underwriting, the underwriters on the deal, the timing of the market, is it a good market typically? So, you know, it's going public's a real deal. It's a lot of work. Okay. You mentioned investing in IPOs. Last year, 2020, was the hottest IPO market in 20 years. Mm -hmm. A lot of interest in these companies, especially tech companies, coming to market. Mm -hmm. um, you are an IPO investor. You like investing in that space. How do you go about it? What do you look for? Uh, well, I look at, first of all, to follow an IPO market, you're going to need a tool. So you, the calendar is, is intense. So it's long and it changes hourly. So you, you can't can't just read a newspaper, it's too fluid. So you probably need a digital tool to say what's on the calendar, mm -hmm. what's coming out as we call it. And then you look at the strength of the underwriting team and typically several firms will rate them, A, B, C, and the A deal with Goldman coming out, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, et cetera. That's a hot deal. You know, they're gonna rate it. So you need a rating system, you need, and then you look at the strength of the underwriting team and you look at the industry typically, and they usually come in waves too, Bill, like all of a sudden mm -hmm. pharma deals will be hot for three months mm. and then another wave will come through and you look at tech's going to be hot. So you kind of just got to have a feel, but you have to, you have to buttress, buttress it with data. Are so you, oh, so he, he's using some terminology like hot, for yeah. example, means uh, like this deal prices, uh, all the shares are allocated and it might, it might be a double, it might it might do its first trade a hundred percent higher than what you paid for it, right? Right. You so, may come out at eighteen, and it may trade up to you know thirty. Now, yeah. if it, and 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 we call being some deals break, and that means it comes out at eighteen, and it does not even it sells down to seventeen. That's a broken IPO, and that happens mm -hmm. a lot. So not these, not you know not a majority of the time, but it's not infrequent. So you have to be smart in the IPO markets. It's fast. Staying. So here's one of the things I was taught about, you know, IPOs growing up in finance is that if there's such a good deal, why are there selling shareholders selling this to the market? You know, and we mentioned, we mentioned point. this earlier and Steve really doesn't care because he trades them, but we had this discussion, you know, an hour ago before we uh, wrestled Steve into this chair <laughs> and he so graciously decided <laughs> to do this with us. But, about 70% of the IPO market, these shares are below where they were priced mm -hmm. a year after they've come out. So, so the, a good underwriter wants to, you know, wants to get as much as they can. It, there's kind of a conflict of interest there because the underwriter uh, wants to get as much as they can for the company, but then the people who are buying the shares yeah. want to get, get them at a fair price as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when you're going through an IPO, you have a great promise, excitement. But as you said, they might go underwater from their IPO pricing because they have to deliver. And delivering right. can often be harder than the promise right. because there's economic cycles that mm -hmm. are difficult to go through or something changes in, in that industry. So that's why some of them break eventually. They go under their IPO uh, price. But Steve, what does it say when a company IPOs and you see their stock price shoot up 20, 50, 100 percent, you know, shortly after they go public. If, I mean, that's money that's left on the table. Yeah. And that's typically why they, they, they need to raise capital. And so they need, need to do it one way or another, debt or equity. And if they go out and it goes flying up, they're only typically selling about, let's say, on average, 15 to 25 percent of the company. Okay. So they're not selling the entire company that way. So they get good name recognition out there. They get good buzz out there. So you are leaving some money on the table, but there is some good news because they haven't sold everything. But is that the, the fault of the underwriters? 
it's it's no way to win that game if you think about it, Bill. If it breaks, the people that buy it are upset. The people that indicated mm -hmm. for it, you say, I want a thousand shares of this company coming out tomorrow. The underwriters are in a tough position because if it they price it at 18 and it goes to 30, is the company out twelve dollars per share? But if it goes to sixteen, then everyone's mad. That so True. it's a really True. difficult needle to thread. Now, the, the other thing I wanted to ask about the IPOs, because, you know, we're talking about the potential for big gains in, in a short period of time, but there is a finite number of shares that are being offered, and most people cannot get these shares. So how, do, how does one go about even getting into that? It's very hard for an individual investor to get IPO shares of big companies mm -hmm. uh, because big clients that do big business with the underwriters are interested in those shares as well. And financial institutions of Fidelity or someone like that is indicating for hundreds of thousands of shares. Yeah, and people like Steve Umberg. <laughs> so, gobbling so up all hard. the shares. Yeah, so it's 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 hard for anyone to get shares mm -hmm. of a good You know, it, it's interesting. I had a I've got a friend who uh, who I believe has a sizable account at Merrill Lynch. He lives in another state. And uh, he put in for the Robin Hood. Robin Hood is going public. And he put in for the Robin Hood IPO, and they they just told him right away, you know, <laughs> that uh, you have to do all the IPOs. Some of them are junky IPOs that they know aren't going to go up. But if you want to get the hot deals, you have to buy the junky ones. Mm -hmm. Well, this guy was was like, you're not you're not one of the big dogs, so you're not going to get any. So, or you've got to start doing some of the junky ones, but looks like this is looking to come public in about a month. And I'm just guessing that, uh, given everything that's happened with, um, you know, with the Robin Hooders and the Reddit followers and, mm -hmm. and all that, uh, there's going to be a tremendous amount of interest in this one. And I think it's, it's going to be, um, it's going to be brought to the market in a most unique fashion too, because Robin Hood feels kind of a duty and an obligation to uh, help their account holders with this. And they're going to let very small people, you know, in on this deal. So uh, did you have any other questions? Well, uh, you know, Steve, I, I wouldn't want to put you on the spot. And I asked you <laughs> if it was okay to even ask this question, um, but we were discussing SPACs, okay? Special purpose acquisition companies. These have really been in vogue in the last couple of years. And would you like to, you know, share your thoughts on these as an IPO investor? Yeah, as a general investor, because I, I, I don't want to limit it to IPO, but I, the SPACs are hard to, hard to judge because there's really no defined company that's being purchased with existing earnings and revenue. Mm -hmm. Your a SPAC is really someone raising money to go find something that has earnings and revenue. It's a blank check company. It's, yeah. And so my view is I, I don't understand. I, I, I'm not personally typically going to make that bet. Why yeah. I, I'm going to invest in something that I hope someone finds. I'd rather go find that. Mm -hmm. So the, these are affluent people that are starting these SPACs too, that have no knowledge and of you're financing. Really, you're them, really just right? buying on that person's yeah. skill yeah. and network. Yeah. And that's fine, but to me, I'd like to find something with real revenue and earnings. But there's celebrities in some cases bringing these, right, right. starting these things. So that that doesn't, you know, make a lot of sense to me. So you, you have another question, Bill? No, uh, no, thank you yeah. for sharing your expertise. Well, we, we usually wrap it up with a little, you know, with sports and sports news and all that. We've worn out, you know, Drew Brees and the New Orleans Saints. <laughs> So I'm going to I'm going to tell football. you a little history. Now I'm going to go back to to VMI. So oh. we don't we don't get these. In 1983, we were we were coached by this gentleman named Wade Williams, who left a year later to to go to Clemson. And we had a top 30 program. They they actually had a Division One indoor meet with all the Division One schools, and that's numerous in Virginia. And that included George Mason. It was at the the George Mason Fieldhouse in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, George Mason, Virginia, Virginia Tech. And my friend Steve got fifth in the 60 meter sprint. Wow. White guy <laughs> and uh, scored two points for us. And it came down to the very last 
event. Uh, George Mason was a national champion at in track outdoors in Baton Rouge, I think, in 1987. They were good. And we beat them, and we needed his two points to, <laughs> to win that meet. And so, but, but also, too, you didn't mention this. Uh, now, you own two arena football franchises, right? Yeah. Which ones were those? Um, Birmingham Steel Dogs and the Jacksonville Tomcats. And how did that work out for you? It, it was great in, in several ways. I met some really neat people that are lifelong friends. And we enjoyed the ride, but the model, this just goes to show you, and there's a difference between investing and just having fun. And that was, <laughs> was fun. having fun because it's a, <laughs> the first game you go, how did the scoreboard look? The second game is you're asking, how many tickets did we sell? <laughs> so it was kind of, it was, it was a good experience. No, that's really cool. And, but we've got a connection now because one of your coaches was the uh, Alabama All-American tailback, Bobby Humphrey. Yeah who has a son named Marlon, who also played at Alabama, and he's one of the top DBs in the NFL now, yeah. playing for the Ravens, mm -hmm. right? And so y'all have remained buddies, and we're I am a diehard LSU track and field fan. Go to some of their meets. I've been to Jacksonville for the, uh, for the, for the uh, Eastern NCAA uh, preliminary round, and that's where it's mm -hmm. going to be this year. I don't think I'm. I think my wife has already said I can't go because Mudbug Madness is in town. Maybe, <laughs> maybe other. Uh, Brit, so Brittley Humphrey was was Bobby's daughter, who's running at the Texas Relays, where I've been several times in Austin. And uh, this is the LSU Tigers. Men are ranked second. The women are ranked. Uh, the women finished third indoors, as did the men finish second. I think they're much better outdoors because 2019 was a, all those people have their eligibility back. And uh, LSU looks like the strongest team by far uh, at Texas Relays, uh, given what they've done so far. So that's really, uh, that's it on, on a sports <laughs> note. We are so thankful yes. to have our friend Steve Umberger here in town with us. And Steve, and we wish you time, all the success with your new business venture. Thank you. And yeah. I get so uh, excited. I raised my voice and Wesley back here running the camera says that. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> thank you for watching. Anyway. Facebook friends, we'll see you next Friday afternoon. Have a great weekend. Make good decisions and watch out for low-flying aircraft. <laughs>